Welcome to this new series of the Massey Dialogues. My name is Natalie DeRosier and I'm the principal of Massey College. Massey College is located on indigenous land, the land of the Seneca, the Huron Wendat, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. We are grateful for their stewardship of the land and for the ability that we have to continue our work here. The Massey Dialogues are based on the idea of bringing together the voices of experts and the voices of the young researchers. This intergenerational aspect is key to the vision. We want to discuss issues of the day and hear different perspectives. I want to thank the Massey community for the wealth of good suggestions that we have received throughout the summer, and particularly to Keshna Sud and Michael Valpi for, and their committee for putting together this fall program. Enjoy today's discussion. Hello, my name is Michael Valpi and uh, I'm a senior fellow at Massey College. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining us to commemorate Remembrance Day on, on the top half of the North American continent. It's a, a memorial day of honor not only for the tens of thousands of indigenous who fought with loyalty to the crown and with unsurpassed bravery over 400 years of settler colonialism in what is now Canada. But I have to add, it's also a memorial of shame for those same peoples whose loyalty was met with denial of the right to vote, the betrayal of their treaty rights, theft of ancestral, ancestral lands, and forced attendance at residential schools, and centuries of, of uh, discrimination and humiliation. We're here today in this college to try to sort meaning out of the paradox of honor and shame. And we're fortunate in having uh, an outstanding guest and two outstanding past planet panelists both of whom are members of the college, to speak to us. And let me begin by introducing uh, the two college members. Uh, Kia Dunn is a recent Massey Junior Fellow alumnus. His family has roots that go back generations into Métis Nation. He holds a BA and MA in philosophy from Carleton University. He holds a Juris Doctor and Master's in Law from University of Toronto, where he wrote his graduate thesis on the legal principle of the honour of the Crown and its implications for Aboriginal law in Canada. He has written on moral psychology and mindfulness, and he runs his own not-for-profit Japanese martial art program in Jiu-Jitsu. Senior fellow Phil Fontaine, an Ojibwe, is a member of Manitoba Saguin First Nation. He attended residential schools and has recounted powerfully, very powerfully, uh, the abuse he experienced. He is a graduate of the University of Manitoba. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission credits him with placing the issue of residential schools on the national agenda. He served as Manitoba Vice Chief of the Assembly of First Nations, served three terms as Grand Chief of the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs, and served an unprecedented three terms as National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations. Chief Fontaine successfully negotiated the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement resulting in a final contribution of more than $5 billion to survivors. He is today a special advisor to the Royal Bank of Canada on Indigenous business. He holds honorary degrees from 18 universities, including this one at the University of Toronto in law. He is an officer of the Order of Canada. And finally, I come to the introduction of our special guest, uh, Major General Jocelyn Paul is a member of Huron-Wendat First Nation and was born and raised in the Wendake First Nation in Quebec. 
He obtained a bachelor's degree in history, a master's degree in anthropology before joining the regular armed forces in 1991 and beginning, if I can say this, a, a meteoric rise through the ranks. He's been a senior officer in the renowned Royal 22nd Regiment, uh, the Van Dues. He has held senior commanding positions in Kandar, Afghanistan, the Middle East, Kosovo, and across Canada. He was awarded the Meritorious Service Cross in 2009 for the performance of his unit in Kandahar. He currently is Director General of International Security Policy in Ottawa, and he holds the highest rank of an Indigenous officer in the Canadian Armed Forces. So welcome, sir, and welcome to all of you. Uh, the format we're gonna follow, Major General, is that <clears throat> you and I are going to talk for about 15 minutes followed by uh, a 15 minute conversation with Kia and a 15 minute conversation with Chief Fontaine. They will be free to take the conversation wherever their interest and curiosity leads. And I hope where you will want to follow. And I would like to start off just by asking you, what have you, how have you spent today so far? What have you done? Well, I left uh, the office uh, yesterday evening. It was probably uh, 11 p.m. We had a bit of a busy day. Uh, there's a lot going on right now on the international scene. So uh, stayed in bed till eight, uh, did a little bit of physical training. And then I watched, you know, uh, Remembrance Day on national TV. And I decided to uh, then reflect a little bit, you know, on uh, what I did during my whole career, I guess. And uh, then I started thinking about uh, what is it that I was going to be uh, discussing with all of you today. And uh, so I uh, put on my uniform proudly, uh, went into my, uh, my archive box and decided to uh, pull, you know, uh, a wampum belt that I would like to probably leverage during the discussion with all of you. Great. You're going to touch on certainly the things I want to ask you about, and I'm sure that Kia and Phil will be talking to you about as well. Um, just tell me straight off, what does the Director General of International Security Policy do? Basically, I'm, I'm responsible of uh, managing Canadian defense policy. Uh, so I'm, I'm having a lot of discussion with our allies. We are providing advice to the, the Minister of National Defense uh, on our uh, relationship with our allies. Uh, when, when the minister is traveling abroad, uh, I'm always part of his traveling party. And uh, so basically we're managing everything Canada uh, has to deal with uh, within NATO, but also uh, with the US, France, Germany, all of our closest allies. Okay. Um, in an earlier conversation we had, uh, you spoke of seeing Canada, and I hope I'm quoting you right, through the lens of history of, of central of, of uh, settler dependence on indigenous peoples for survival. What's that mean? Well, 15 minutes is extremely short, but uh, I've always been of the belief that to understand where we are going, you got to understand where you're coming from. And uh, today, as uh, we are uh, reflecting on Remembrance Day, uh, all of us are focused on, on the National Memorial uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, we keep talking about uh, the veterans of the, the First World War, Second World War, Korea, peacekeeping mission, Afghanistan. But I, I also like to reflect a little bit looking at another national monument, the Aboriginal monument, which is like 300 meters away from the National War Memorial. And when I'm looking at that monument, who, by the way, is probably one of the most, if not the most beautiful in Ottawa, I like to reflect on uh, what is it that my, my ancestors have done in the defense of that country over the last 400 years. And, uh, you know, being an historian by trade, I always like to go back to the beginning of, uh, you know, New France. Uh, we got to keep in mind that basically uh, there was an alliance made up up front 
uh, between our ancestors and the French and later on the Brits. And uh, the warriors of our nation uh, in Eastern Canada specifically, because this is where the whole thing started, uh, we were always allied uh, to the, uh, of the crown, the French crown, the British crown. And uh, that, that alliance that was forged in blood uh, over the last few centuries uh, is, is something that we are trying to keep alive um, in our own tradition. And the reason why I'm saying that is when you go to, uh, to a museum, when you look, uh, you know, at, uh, at, at history book, uh, they talk a little, a little about it, but probably not enough. Without the contribution of our warriors during the colonial wars, I mean, Canada wouldn't be what it is today. Uh, New France would have never lasted uh, for not but 50 years. Uh, so our warriors uh, were always at the edge of this colonial battle. Uh, we like to look at ourselves as warriors as well. I mean, in our society, the Iroquoian society at contact, I mean, we had civil chief, we had war chief. And uh, so it is, uh, it is a mindset that we always, we always had in our nations. And, you know, not only did we help the French, but right after, you know, the British conquest, I mean, uh, Murray uh, signed off, you know, a, a peace treaty with us before signing off, you know, the surrendering, uh, the surrender of the French. And, and, and that's why throughout history, uh, up until, you know, the War of 1812, during the colonial era, our warriors were always available out there, always ready to fight for Canada. Uh, so uh, I would like to show you maybe uh, a, a wampum belt that, that means a lot to me. Uh, it's, we call that the seven fire wampum. So you can see the seven line. You can see, you know, the war hacks in the middle. Uh, so basically that wampum belt means a lot to my community. Uh, the seven lines are representing the seven Indian Reserve uh, of uh, the, the St. Lawrence Valley, uh, the Huron, uh, the Algonquin, the Mohawk, the Abenaki, all of these villages basically who, where our ancestors, you know, were, were always living and we're still living there, by the way. And these people were always ready to go, are always ready to call the answer of the crown so that we can protect the colony. So we're, we're extremely proud of that. So when I reflect about, once again, you know, my Remembrance Day, well, I think about my fellow soldiers with who I went to, uh, to war in Afghanistan, but also I like to think about my own ancestors. I want to take what you said and try to fit it together with two other things. Um, one is, how do you fit that history of responding to the call for support uh, to the Crown? with the way that indigenous peoples, with, with the many years of how indigenous peoples have been discriminated against, uh, as I said a moment ago, had their treaties uh, ignored, uh, their ancestral lands taken away, were discriminated, discriminated against, were uh, humiliated, denied the right to vote, and so forth. And how do you fit that together with, if I understand correctly, what the two-row wampum treaty is about, that basically saw indigenous peoples and settler colonists as two streams going down the river, side by side, but not, not touching one another. How does that fit with your idea of indigenous peoples as coming to the aid of settler colonists? You've got 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> well, the two-row wampum is a wampum of uh, the Iroquois Confederation. Uh, but but you, got, you got the concept right, i.e. Uh, two parallel lines. Uh, I would say we got to go back to history to understand, you know, how the Indian Act came to be um, at the end of the 19th century. Our nations were still economically important, military important and politically important till the end of uh, the War of 1812. So the decline of the influence of our people really started at the end of the second half of the 19th century. And, and then, you know, the Indian Act got imposed upon us and you know the rest of the story. Uh, so I think as a nation, as a country, 
we need to look back, reflect a little bit on uh, these historical lessons, and uh, we need to, to try to, to develop a better future, you know, for all of us, uh, you know, citizens of that, that country. And, uh, you know, uh, we cannot fix the past, uh, but we can learn out of it. And uh, it is what it is. I like to tell all the time to our young Aboriginal people, get an education, get a degree. Uh, let's let's showcase what is it that we are capable of, you know, as human beings. And uh, that's a little bit what I tried to do myself as a soldier. When I signed, you know, when I joined up uh, more than 30 years ago, I was not expecting to become a general at all. Uh, I just wanted, you know, to, to, to join the army, do my best, uh, show some leadership. And, and I got a lot of support, I got to tell you, uh, from, from the member of the Canadian Armed Forces. So, uh, yeah, we, we certainly can look back. I mean, my dad was a member of the Band Council for a few years, and he shared with me all of these stories of him getting the right to vote in the early 60s and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, you, you, yeah, you, you can keep a certain form of, of animosity about it, but we need to look forward. And by the way, even if my dad ended up getting the right to vote in 1961 or 1962, he, he would never vote because he was considering himself, you know, as a First Nation member first. So he got that right, you know, uh, in his midlife. But as far as I can recall, you know, he did not exercise it. Did he understand what you did and why you did what you did? Yes, he, he was extremely proud. Uh, again, you know, in my own community, we had many uh, members of the, the, the nation who ended up uh, joining during their whole life. We were still, we still have that, that spirit of being warrior, you know, uh, warrior for the nation, but also warrior for the country. And he actually encouraged me with that career. My, my dad was a snowshoe and a canoe maker, uh, like my grandfather, like my great grandfather. Uh, so uh, life, life was tough. I mean, he, he was not making a lot of money. He was very proud of his uh, traditional skills, but uh, he was just hoping that I would have, you know, maybe a, a better life. Uh, and uh, so, yes, he pushed me, absolutely. He pushed me uh, towards that career. Uh, same thing with my mother. And actually, the, the whole family, I guess, are pretty very proud of what I ended up achieving as a soldier. Two, uh, two questions before I turn it over to Kia. Uh, one, do you feel at home in the armed, for in the armed forces? Uh, or do have you faced discrimination through your career? And secondly, what have you done as an officer to make the armed forces uh, a comfortable place for, for, for indigenous youth? When I joined uh, the Vain Dues, uh, it was in 1991. It was like eight, nine months, you know, after the, the Oka crisis. So uh, some individual in the battalion sometimes would be making a derog derogative type of comment, uh, but it was really a, a small, small minority. Uh, so uh, I just decided not to, to pay attention to it. And I decided, you know, to, to keep showing them what I was capable of, you know, as a junior officer. The institution has evolved a lot. The Canadian Armed Forces 30 years ago, I mean, we, were, we didn't really have any specific Aboriginal program for our young men and women. Uh, maybe Bold Eagle in Western Canada was starting as a program. Now, the situation is really totally different today. Uh, we have the Aboriginal Leadership uh, Opportunity Year uh, that has been stood up maybe eight, nine years ago. We have, uh, you know, Aboriginal Entry Program all across the country from an ocean to the other. So basically, what these programs are all about is they're giving you the basic skill on how to become a soldier. Uh, you do your basic military qualification. But on top of it, uh, during the evening and during the, uh, the weekends, uh, we have some, you know, elders that are teaching these youth uh, some, some part of our culture. So we went from having nothing to having all of these programs in place today. And when I was commanding uh, the 4th Canadian Division, when I was commanding the Army of Ontario till last year, uh, we stood up, you know, one of these programs for Ontario, we call it Grey Wolf. So it's a fantastic opportunity. We have a lot of our young men and women who ended up growing up in cities a little bit remote, you know, from their original culture. When they join the CAF, when they join the Canadian Armed Forces, they are learning about their own Aboriginal route through this program. So we certainly came, you know, a long way as an institution. 
Can you give us just a quick example of, of what elders bring in to the training program? What do they, what do they teach? Well, we have different elders from different community because, as you know, our First Nations are extremely different from an ocean to the other. Uh, and we also have the Métis. Uh, so, uh, you know, we are far from being an homogeneous group. We are extremely heterogeneous. But uh, the, the original program tend to focus on, you know, the, the original culture. And they will be teaching the youth uh, history. They will be teaching the youth uh, what is it that our ancestors did you know to defend the colony what is it that we did uh during the 20th century as first nation warrior uh they will be talking about traditional belief uh normally they also have sweat lodge and so on and so forth so uh, that's that's basically what we do and, and obviously when we are hiring these elders i mean we we have a kind of a screening process in place we ensure that the right people are teaching the right thing you know to our young people do you, you get anyone saying, you know, why should we be fighting with you guys? You gave us such a hard time. You ripped us off in the past. Do you have that? Well, it's, it's a little bit sensitive as a topic. Some, some people have different views on it, obviously. I guess it depends on, on who you are. Uh, how do you see yourself? Uh, so, some communities today in Eastern Canada like to look at themselves like, you know, almost autonomous communities, while other communities are, I would say, uh, do see themselves more like in, in, the, in the mainstream of Canada. Uh, so you ask 10 First Nation people their views about it, you can end up having 10 different answers. I guess it has a lot to do on, uh, with how you perceive yourself as a human being. I like to say mm -hmm. all the time that, you know, uh, human beings are like onions. And it's not only in Canada. It's like that all around the world. You know, what are, what are the layers of your uh, identity? Uh, are, are you First Nation first? Are you Canadian second? Uh, born and raised in Quebec in third place? You see what I mean? Uh, in my yeah. own community, some people identify at, as Canadian first and, you know, First Nation uh, member after, while for others, it's the other way around. And it would offer to you that, uh, the way you envision your own identity is something that can be also evolving, you know, in your lifetime. Kia, do you want to take it away? Sure. I mean, that actually was one of my major questions, and I'm just surprised that we got into it so organically, was, you know, there's, as I was looking into things, there's, uh, from what I understand, still, uh, like Wyandotte uh, communities south of the border in the United States as well, from sort of around that time, and they just sort of emerged and continued. Um, so there are so many layers of identity between borders, between communities, between language groups, between former alliances, who was part of which treaty, who was on which side of which lines. So my question sort of to start off is, what do you see as the, the best way to sort of navigate that one well, personally, and also as advice for others who, do you think that the military presents a way to sort of navigate your own identity or, and, and what are some of the difficulties and challenges given all of those layers? It's a very non-typical Canadian, perhaps, a path to have to, to walk. Um, how do you navigate that? Actually, I would offer to you, it's way much easier to navigate that today than it was maybe 30 years ago, especially after the OCA crisis. Uh, we like to say that the Canadian Armed Forces like to be a, a mirror, a reflection of what Canada has become today. So diversity is uh, something that is uh, certainly encouraging to, uh, you know, inside the institution. So I also uh, see young Canadians that are more curious about that. Uh, for example, you know, the Vain Dues, when I signed up 30 years ago, it was very much, you know, Quebecers, Quebecois, French Canadian hardcore, if you see what I mean. Uh, nowadays, in my regiment, we have people from so many different communities. Uh, we have Anglophone joining the regiment. Uh, we have now uh, many Asian, you know, serving in the Vain Dues. We have people of Asian descent. So uh, the, the regiment, the army is becoming more diverse. And with that diversity, I would say there's... Uh, there's a, there's an additional layers of curiosity people the youth are very much interested in one another you know uh background i would say they are probably more uh, inclined to listen to ask questions and respect you know uh, other perspective other other people identity if i can say that and, and actually you know uh, all of us are we all go back to to the same couple you know that that couple who walked away from 
from Africa 125,000 years ago. Uh, during all my deployments uh, around the world, if there's one thing that I've that I've learned is that all of us human beings, we want to have the same thing for our young, uh, for our children. We want them to be educated. We want them to live in peace. We want them to have some economic opportunity. There's way much more uniting us than things dividing us. And, you know, as, as a serving member, uh, when some of my subordinate would be asking questions about First Nation, I was always very glad, very happy to to teach them you know what we are all about and, and by the way even within our own community we are extremely uh, diverse you, you gotta you really gotta go back above and beyond the ban uh, the ban list here i mean my in my community the paul family is the smallest family well there's a good reason for it because originally we're not huron when that you know we're malicit so my great great grandfather was a malicit uh, you know, and he ended up marrying a woman, uh, my, my great great grandmother. She was a seaweed, and he changed band. And my my spouse she's from the Inu nation, and uh, so my children are basically a, a melting pot of different First Nation identity. Uh, I'm I'm related to Chief Picard, you know, the original chief of the Assembly of First Nation in in Quebec through my wife. Uh, he is a, you know her her first degree cousin. So uh, we got to be careful right. about putting etiquette on people. You, you really got to scratch who people are. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, but if you want to get to the bottom of it, you got to talk to the elders. You got to understand where you're coming from. When I was a kid growing up in the community, the, the, the elders were looking at me, laughing a bit, saying, well, you're not you're wrong. You're a knickknack. You're a malice. I, I had right. no clue what they were talking about. Then my, my dad obviously explained me the whole story. Uh, so, yeah, uh, really human beings are, are onions. Well, and you were saying, I mean, this is sort of important to look towards the future of Canada, too. I mean, and I guess this was sort of the question that I initially had from a point of maybe concern was that if you find, and in your experience, maybe this changed over time, that Indigenous people who came to the, the armed forces would sort of find themselves and find their identity more with the armed forces and maybe less with their communities over time, or now are we getting to a place where all of those not only historic identities, but these new emerging identities and these, you know, like you'll marry people and new communities will form and we have to sort of leave that open to change so that we can continue to grow as all human beings do um, and still continue to have our identities and our histories tied into our future. Do you think that the armed forces is approaching that process in a supportive way? And do you think, would you offer any cautions to say someone from a very small reserve in rural Canada who is interested in, in participating? Mm -hmm. No, I, I would say to these uh, youth coming from, uh, you know, um, isolated or remote communities, uh, the institution is way much more welcoming than it used to be, no doubt about it. Uh, we encourage diversity. And uh, by, by the way, you know, all of us First Nation, uh, me, T, when we decide to, to join the CAF, I like to say all the time that we are walking into the footsteps of our ancestors. I mean, we had like thousands and thousands of... Uh, of our relatives who ended up signing up, you know, not only during the, the colonial war, but also in the first, the second world war, during the Korean war, during the peacekeeping mission. So we have always been part of that institution. And what's great about it is that that contribution is now openly recognized and acknowledged. And actually it's being promoted. So, you know, uh, as a guy who's about to, to, to be retiring in a few years, I'm extremely glad to see that the, the institution, you know, transform like that. And also I would like to tell the, the, the people even if you leave your community uh, for a, a contract of four years, a contract of 10 years, 20 years, I mean, you're, you're not abandoning your people. Uh, you will have the opportunity, you know, to, to, to grow as a soldier, but also to grow as a First Nation member. Uh, nearby our military bases, uh, all across the country, there's Aboriginal friendship centers, you know, everywhere. Uh, you will be in, in, in contact with your home community. Uh, you're going to have leave period. I mean, you can visit your, your relative. They're going to come and visit you. And, and also, the day you will decide to retire, you know, from the Canadian Armed Forces, you will have learned skills, leadership skills. You will have learned a trade. And then you will become a plus. You will become, you know, an add-on value for your home community. And, and this is why so many of our, uh, you know, elders who were veterans during the First and Second World War, when they came back, Many of them ended up being chiefs. You know, they ended up working for Aboriginal rights. I'm thinking here uh, of Mr. Favel, 
so Mr. Fable is from the Sweet Grass First Nation in Saskatchewan. And, and last weekend we unveiled, you know, a portrait, uh, his, his, his painted portrait at, at, at the National War Museum. And you know, I didn't know about Mr. Fable until I had the privilege of being invited to that event. But I mean, as soon as he came back from the Second World War as a decorated soldier, I mean, he, he, he fought his whole life, the Aboriginal veterans, uh, and, and he became also a politician. So, uh, and that's the way I like to look at myself, you know, when I'm retiring a few years on the road, I'm going to go back to Kandake, and then if uh, I can offer anything to my community, I will be able to step to the plate, uh, share my hmm. stories, and maybe be a positive, contributing member to my home nation. And what better way? I mean, that just seems like such a, a natural way for a Canadian identity to emerge in the next hundred years. I mean, like these kinds of connections, uh, they just sort of form the basis of so much family and future and community. Uh, you mentioned sort of how you, sort of ubiquitous this is to, to human culture, uh, sort of a lot of these practices and sort of warrior culture, for lack of a better term, but also participation in um, the, the politics of their regions. And I remember that Michael mentioned, you said that in some of your other campaigns in Afghanistan, I think also maybe in Palestine, you were able to reference indigenous traditions in approaching those. And I really just, I was just so curious when I heard that, I was like, how, there was no detail. So I'm just want could you just talk about that? Yeah, maybe uh, one funny story. Uh, uh, when I was working in, in Palestine, uh, in the Middle East, uh, in Israel, um, I, I was kind of entertaining a relationship with uh, the security advisor of uh, President Mahmoud Abbas. And um, so he was an elder in his early 80s. And uh, so we would be talking business, uh, you know, Palestinian security forces training and so on and so forth. But, you know, he... He was a, an extremely interesting man. I mean, he, he had been all over, the, uh, all over the place with Yasser Arafat. So I would listen to him all the time. He would talk to me about his culture. I was doing with them, you know, what I was doing growing up in Wandaki, listening to the, uh, the elders. And at some point, we're having a, a casual discussion about food. And he's explaining to me that uh, when he was a younger man in Palestine, people were never wasting any part of the animal. So they would have, you know, the sheep brain, they would have the sheep tongue. And then I told him, well, it's funny because in my own community, uh, our, our the, the, the older generation, they were doing the same thing with the moose. I mean, they would have the tongue moose, they would have the brain moose. Then he stood up and he looked at me, gave me a big hug saying, well, somewhere, <laughs> somehow we must be cousins. <laughs> wow. And uh, when I was in uh, Kandahar, uh, I would sit down, you know, with the village leader, uh, the district leader, that was part of my mandate. And, uh, you know, Kandahar, Afghanistan is, is an extremely complex, you know, country. Uh, to understand southern Afghanistan, you have to understand the Pashtu Confederation. And then you got to realize that within the Pashtu Confederation, there is some dominant tribes and there's tribes that have been dominated forever. And you, if you want to understand Southern Afghanistan, you got to understand these dynamics. And very often the, the communities were fueling the insurrection. Well, you were talking to the locals and they had been kind of marginalized, you know, by the mainstream of Afghanistan politics for a long period of time. So I, I would sit down with uh, some of these leaders. I would listen to their story. I would tell them that, oh, I was also part of a tribe who used to have a confederation during the colonial era and so on and so forth. So I was always leveraging these connections uh, to, to basically have a, a human to human being discussion. So uh, yeah, my, I guess my background really helped me out uh, in every single one of my deployment because I was not only looking at the locals through the eyes of a nation state, I was looking at these countries, these nation state as something being very complex from a socio-political, cultural perspective. So I guess it, it, it made me someone willing to listen to others. Right. I mean, and what a, a good argument to have a more diverse military if, and if it, just to have those kinds of people present. Uh, before I hand it off to, uh, uh, to Chief Phil, Fontaine, I uh, just wanted to touch on sort of the, the history point one last time because you mentioned that um, that we sort of Canadians as a whole, I think, are now tracing their identities or at least hearing the story told a little more fully that, you know, everyone kind of goes back at some point to a treaty or lack thereof. 
uh, somewhere on the land and that there was, you know, the treaty, uh, well, the, like the Royal Proclamation after the French capitulation uh, in 1763. And then sort of the, I think John Burroughs and a few others are pushing the idea that uh, the Treaty of Niagara, which happened the following year, was kind of a ratification for the communities that were present. And, you know, thousands of indigenous members showed up to Niagara and had this big agreement as that is now becoming sort of a, I hesitate to say competing narrative of sort of origin of sovereignty for Canada, but as that kind of that narrative emerges as an option, do you think there's the possibility for like a refounding of an indigenous identity that might make it more um, sort of like bring those two sides close together, make it less of a, you're leaving your community and joining the Canadian community and actually a way to bring the Canadian closer to the indigenous, <laughs> if, you know, for lack of a better way of putting it, rather than always pulling the indigenous identity closer to the Canadian, be like, oh, become Canadian. Well, maybe Canadians could become closer to their own roots and that we're, we're all sort of treaty people in that sense. What role do you see that as having? Well, it is a very, very uh, complex question. <laughs> so finish with that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am Canada. Right. We are Canada. Canada comes from, uh, you know, the Huron language and it means village. I mean, the country's name is coming from my home nation. Mm. Uh, we are the first nation. Uh, we were here. Uh, and, you know, it's acknowledged by, by mainstream Canada. But, you know, I'm very proud to be a Canadian, but I'm so very proud to be a Huron Wendat of, of Malisic descent. Hmm. And uh, I am very comfortable as a human being with that proximity. But I'm not going to give up my Huron Wendat identity <laughs> to be amalgamated into Canada, you know, as, as an object. And actually, I would like to offer that whoever we are, we have to be proud of our different origins. You are a Canadian. Well, let's be proud. If you are a Canadian a member of a First Nation, be proud of it. If you are a Canadian of French Canadian descent, be proud of it. If you are a Canadian of Scottish descent, be proud of it. Uh, if you are a Canadian uh, who has, you know, Indian background from India, be proud of it. Uh, so I, I don't feel like we need to surrender our deep inner identity, uh, forget it, uh, to be a Canadian. I, I think you can certainly manage both. Uh, but, uh, you know, when I, when I think uh, of myself first, I mean, I'm First Nation. It's a very succinct answer to a complex question. Thanks very much. I'll pass it off to uh, Chief Fontaine. Thank you very much, Kia. Major General Paul, you're an absolutely amazing story. Uh, you do our community uh, proud. Um, you re represent the best of the best in our community, and uh, I'm uh, really so proud to have to have this opportunity to meet with you. Uh, unfortunately, we can't be face-to-face, uh, -face, I mean, in person, but uh, this is uh, not a bad uh, uh, alternative. I was wondering, uh, to pick up on this uh, part of your conversation with Kia, uh, you, you speak about being a proud First Nation person, a proud Canadian, there is some reference to 1763, the War of 1812, and talked about the Indian Act of 1876. Um, I've always regarded one of the uh, one of the uh, big lies, if I can put it that way, that all Canadians have been forced to live uh, and accept as the truth is that Canada was founded by two nations, the French and the English. And we've been excluded from that part of this important Canadian story, because there are actually three uh, founding nations, three founding peoples, the French, the English, and the First Peoples. And uh, in my view, and I want to ask you if you what your perspective on this is, in my view, we would uh, do so much good uh, to Canada's future if we were to finally recognize 
this fact, this historic fact, that there are three founding peoples in Canada, and that they should, and that this should be formally recognized in Parliament. What do you think of that, sir? Well, uh, Chief uh, Fontaine, uh, thank you uh, for your kind words. Uh, I think we need to look at it from two different perspectives. And also, you need to understand that as a, as a serving member of the Canadian Armed Forces, I got to be careful in what I'm saying because I shall not, you know, talk about politics. But I, I like to think that there's a general acceptation within Canada that the nation was built on three people. Us, the First Nation, the Inuit, the French, and the English. And, uh, and we should also include the Métis uh, in, in, in that, you know, discussion. So, yes, I, I think most of my friends, French Canadian or English Canadian, uh, in any type of casual discussion, they will certainly acknowledge that. Uh, maybe something that would not have been acknowledged 50, 60, 70 years ago. But I think today, you know, uh, in, in Shikutsimi or in North Bay, it is generally accepted. Uh, now, uh, when it comes down to having uh, the whole thing recognized at, at Parliament, well, uh, it's been a while since I've looked, you know, at, at, at our constitution, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, but, but I think, uh, again, you know, in, in mainstream Canada, you know, on, on, on the Canadian streets, it is well accepted. Uh, I, I would like to think so. And, uh, and actually, I like to look at the whole thing from a positive way. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. My dad was always telling me uh, when I was a kid that uh, when he was young, nobody was kind of talking about having Aboriginal roots, you know, in around Quebec City, around my reserve. Uh, nobody had any, they were using that word in these days, nobody had any savage blood. And, and you look at it now today, 50 years later, everybody's looking into their genealogical tree, trying to see if they have some, you know, Aboriginal, First Nation, Métis connection of some sort. So I like to think that people being curious about it, people looking into their family history is a, is a positive sign. Uh, and I know I'm not fully and totally answering your question, uh, Chief Fontaine. Uh, but that's, that's the way I look at it. And again, you know, I got to wait my word because I shall not venture into political territory here. But I would like to think that eventually uh, this will certainly be uh, discussed, you know, officially at Parliament. And uh, we now have many uh, members of our nations that are MPs. Uh, we also have senators. And, and I know that uh, they, they are certainly uh, stepping up to the plate. And they are certainly, you know, uh, reminding their parliamentarian colleagues of, of who we are and of our existence. And the Assembly of the First Nation also is doing a fantastic job at the, on that regard. Yeah, uh, there is no intention on my part to uh, uh, put you in an, un in an uncomfortable spot with that, uh, with that question. Uh, but uh, I appreciate your, uh, your honest answer. The other thing I was I was wondering about, uh, you're the highest ranking in uh, First uh, Nations um, person in Canada in the military, and uh, I was wondering if there is any sense on, on your part, given your own terrific rise up the ranks, whether there is a, a, a strong possibility that others will follow in your footsteps. And are there any of those people now in the military that are rising up the uh, up the ranks? Uh, absolutely, uh, Chief Fontaine. Uh, we have a uh, within the the institution we have an Aboriginal advisory group, and uh, it, it's made out of people from different you know nations, uh, you know from an ocean to the other. We have some very young members. 20, 24, 25. Uh, there's a few older guy like me, uh, but you know, being a general, unfortunately, I'm extremely uh, 
extremely busy and I cannot put you know enough time into it unfortunately but we do have some young you know corporal master corporal sergeant captain majors who are going up the ranks right now and uh, I, I can certainly see uh, some of them you know uh, having some fantastic and great career uh, so we are certainly on the right path uh, it's a path that has been beaten with uh, generation and, and generation of us wearing moccasins. But yes, we do have, you know, in French, we call it la relève. Uh, we do have, you know, these very promising young uh, men and women who are going to be achieving, you know, great things within the Canadian Armed Forces in 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years. I, I like to think that the future is bright. That's... Uh incredibly encouraging i should make what uh one quick point here when we were kids in residential school uh i mean we talked about war right? we talked about war there were war stories and uh uh, uh heroic exploits by by uh by different uh different regiments and individuals and we of course knew about uh tommy prince mm. uh, I mean, he was known by, by so many. But we also knew about the Vandals when we were kids. We we, we had heard about yeah. the Vandals. We knew about the Vandals, and that we uh, we recognized them as pretty special, uh, special regiment, if you can call them regiment, I suppose. Eh? Uh, well, that's uh, I I. Uh, I always found that interesting that we would we we had a connection with the Vandoos, um, mm -hmm. and uh, in a very uh, uh, positive way, and then of course we'd connect uh, Tommy Prince, the late uh, um, hero, one of the greatest Canadian heroes in the, in the mm -hmm. Second War. We connected with him in a very special way, and. Uh, we, I, I know that when he, when he finally uh, retired from uh, the military, he became one of the people that advocated for his people politically, and in fact was involved in the discussions in the last major amendments to the Indian Act in the early 50s. Mm. And uh, sadly, as you know, sir, uh, he died on the streets of Winnipeg, uh, largely forgotten. And... Uh, there may be, there may have been too many uh, people like Sergeant Tommy Prince, yep. whose contributions to protecting and saving uh, uh, Canadians uh, were largely forgotten. If you, if you look at the, uh, for example, you look at the, and I, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm coming across too negative because that's not my intention, but if you look at the, uh, the special uh, Remembrance Day uh, event that's held every day. I mean, every year in in, in Ottawa, at November 11th. It was only in 1995 that uh, Indigenous peoples became part of the official uh, remember, Remembrance Day uh, celebration there, 1995. And then we used to have two prayers, uh, I think, French and English, and the Indigenous peoples became part of that. So there's some uh, some progress that we should be proud of, uh, even though it comes late, right? But it's never too late. It's always the right time. And uh, you appearing as you have, like out of the mist, how did... Uh, you're, you're Canada's best kept secret, I think, in terms of the uh, First Nation person rising up to this very, very uh, prestigious ranking in the in the military. You are, you are an, an outstanding uh, success story, and we should be celebrating you as as often as we can to give hope and uh, and indeed to inspire. Uh, uh, the community at large, but young people within our community to consider uh, the military, as you were describing, as a, uh, as a real uh, option um, and one that could make a real difference in the lives of not just individuals, but the community at large. 
Well, Chief, once again, uh, thank you for your uh, your kind words. Uh, the only thing I would like to, to add is that, you know, you, you cannot get to that rank alone. Uh, the, the reason why I made it, uh, yeah, I guess I was blessed with uh, a gift, which is I'm always uh, willing to listen to what the people have to say. If you're a good listener in life, you will go far, I like to think. But I was surrounded by some fantastic people from every, you know, origin. Uh, I was given, you know, uh, the chance uh, to lead, you know, men and women. And uh, I, plenty of people gave me the right advice at the right time. I could have nailed myself into the wall many times. But I guess I was just smart enough, you know, to take a good advice at the right time, if I can say that. But it's all about listening. And uh, when you join the CAF, when you join a regiment, a battalion, uh, you will always have a kind of a wizard. You will always have somebody with a lot of wisdom uh, willing to take you under his or her wing, protect you, shape you, and uh, move you in the right direction. Uh, and, you know, uh, I was very fortunate because I came across a lot of these people in my career. And, and maybe just to... Uh, pile on or had, you know, on what you mentioned about uh, Tommy Prince. Uh, fantastic man. Uh, one can argue is, is more known today than he was, you know, 40 years ago. Uh, his service to the country has been largely recognized. And I was reading in the newspaper uh, a few years ago, I think his military medals were part of the collection of a private collector and uh, his regiment, the Princess Patricia, uh, the PPCLI, ended up raising money so that they can buy back, you know, his war medals. So this is a little thing, but it is a little thing that means a lot. Now, when it comes down to our veterans uh, who unfortunately are, are impacted really big time, you know, by these deployments, PTSD, psychological trauma. Yes, this is a reality. Uh, either in peacekeeping mission or, you know, in, in, in combat operation like in Afghanistan, what we see, what, what we experience is extremely difficult. Very, very challenging. And we got to keep care of one another. Uh, you know, when you are on the battlefield, we have what we call battle buddies. You know, the people on your left, the people on your right, you are on the same boat, you are in the same canoe, you, you, you try to do the right thing, you're, you're covering, you're protecting one another. So when I came back from Kandahar, I, I told, you know, my, my men and women, please, the campaign is not over. It's not because we're back home that, you know, everything is done. Because I knew full well that many of us would be impacted by these uh, trauma, by these things that we have seen. So I invited my men and women to look after one another, to protect one another, to create a kind of a support network so that, you know, when you have a brother or sister of arm who's impacted, who's going through some difficult time, a divorce, a depression, seek support or help him or help her. So uh, it, it's extremely important that we keep that network alive and well amongst ourselves, you know, veterans. And... Uh, and, and I would also offer to you that we are more open about it. Uh, in the old days, it is something that people would never talk about. Uh, they were calling that being shell-shocked. Uh, and, and people were kind of hiding it. Nowadays, we still do that to a certain extent, but many of us in uniform are more open about it. Uh, personally, I was heavily impacted, you know, by the campaign. Uh, as I was out there at some point, uh, you know, I lost uh, some soldiers, you know, some colleagues of mine. My, my, my common post was attacked. Uh, I lost, you know, two fellow soldiers. Uh, seven, no, six of them ended up being seriously injured. And at some point, I just couldn't sleep anymore. So I was on uh, sleeping pills. But I had to be there. I was the commander. I had no choice. You know, I, I had to go back into my lab and I had to go back into patrolling. 
And then, you know, coming back home, uh, I was extremely aggressive. And uh, I was thinking a lot. Uh, I had a hard time sleeping. Then I kind of managed it all the best I could myself. But it came back to the surface like six, seven years later. And I had to uh, seek support again. And uh, I did it. And, uh, and actually, you know, uh, my, my family is only better for that. At some point, you know, my, my spouse and my children were looking at me and uh, I, I would just blow up a gasket over nothing. And uh, when I decided to, to step forward and uh, seek some support, uh, it was good for me. But first and foremost, it was good for my loved one. Unfortunately, some of our fellow soldiers, they won't do it. And unfortunately, you know, they will, they will end up in the street. And uh, we do have some uh, retired soldiers. We have some volunteers who are looking after these people, you know, the best they can. So it's all about looking after one another. Uh, but it can be certainly extremely demanding. And uh, when we come back from missions, uh, we always have some, you know, preparation uh, brief, if I can say that. And, uh, you know, our social workers, uh, our military doctor, they kept saying all the time, don't go back home with your, your big army boots. Don't impose yourself. You've been away from home for six, seven, eight, nine months. You know, your spouses have, and, and your children have managed their life in your absence. So come back quietly. Come back a step at a time. And so, yes, very, very demanding. And maybe one last story on that specific topic. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, there was a gentleman in my community. His name was Mr. Siwi. And, uh, you know, my, my grandmother was doing the, the weekly bingo in the community. And he was, like, working, you know, uh, giving, uh, selling, you know, sodas and chips and stuff like that to us, the children. And I always felt like Mr. Siwi was always unhappy he was a very very uh, strict man and uh, you know i was a little bit scared by him very very uh, stiff not smiling a lot but then i realized 15 years later why it's because he had done dv and he had been a soldier and uh, i was told you know by one of his son that uh, he was a sniper but he would never talk about the one. He would never speak about it. Uh, keeping it for himself, like the vast majority of the soldier will do. And you see that with uh, so many veterans uh, in every regiment. They keep it for themselves, and then they struggle with their inner demons, if I can say that. And they try to do the best, you know, for the rest of their life. Uh, so, yes, we're still facing that. We're still dealing with it. But we are doing the best we can as an institution to provide the right level of service for our men and women. And once again, we like to leverage the, the Bell Buddy Network to help one another as well. That's a perfect a ending, man. sir. You're a brave man, but most importantly, you're a, an honest man. Thank you. Yeah, you got Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Major General, for uh, giving us your time. Chief, thank you so much. Kia, thank you so much. Uh, Massey, Massey College is in your debt. I hope you'll come and join us again. Bye now.